Well, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Mike Cargill. I work at Stafford High School in Stafford, Kansas. Uh, I've been here for, I guess, about 12 years now. Uh, I've been teaching health science as part of the curriculum for the past 10 years. And so we've got a little bit of experience. However, I teach all science classes. We're a very small school. Uh, we're a school located in western Kansas. Our, the, the entire district population is about oh, 250 students, I suppose. Uh, about 50 in high school every year, something like that. About 10 to 15 percent of our students are interested in medical science. Of that, about 10 percent of them actually go ahead and, and pursue a, a certification or a, a career in, in medical, medical science. Um, today, what I'd like to take a minute to talk about, uh, we do have lots of students who come back and talk to me about uh, their college experience or their certification experience. And, of course, the question I always ask is, you know, what can I do to, to help you be more successful in a post-secondary setting? And most of the students come back and they pretty much say the same things always. Uh, it's pharmacology is always hard. Uh, the medical math is they find difficult. Uh, you know, it's really microbiology. Those are the things that they seem to struggle with more so than the the common the general ed stuff. The general ed stuff they usually can get through. Actually, most of them get through it while they're still here at Stafford at the high school before they ever leave here. And so we do have a strong, uh, you know, uh, presence with the, with the kids taking college classes. Um, I want to focus today on what I see as where we need to be headed, at least for me here at where I'm at, uh, for the next few years. And that's, that's really including pharmacology into our core curriculum and the skills that are needed for pharmacology. Uh, pharmacology requires a little more um, accuracy and precision than what we put into our general chemistry class usually. And so we're starting to include more accuracy and precision, a lot more percent solutions, a lot more uh, uh, ratios, uh, litigations, pipetting, those kinds of things that will improve our accuracy and precision over time. So with that said, let's see if we can get started on something that's a little bit more interesting than me setting here. Let's see if I can drop down there and then get this down and let's get to our PowerPoint. Now what I have done is make a PowerPoint presentation, but please understand that this PowerPoint presentation, you probably already know everything on it. And you're probably already doing it. And if you are, fantastic. If you're not, these are the things that I'm adding to, to, to what I'm doing here. But please understand that, you, you know, you may already be accomplishing this, this more than I am. So if you are, congratulations. If you're not, these are some things you may want to think about adding to the curriculum. Pharmacology is a big one. We're going to try to be adding it more and more to our, our common, uh, to our, just our core curriculum. Try to encourage, uh, to, you know, implementing it more into the biology, anatomy and physiology, and into chemistry. Uh, and the skills that we learn here really are really directly related to the skills that are related in chemistry. We deliver our, our, program to our students with head rush. Now let me let me start off by telling you that I am not associated with head rush in any way. I don't sell head rush. I'm not an employee of head rush. I just use their program and I find it to be an extremely good program for what we do. We have about 600 modules created uh, for for our healthcare students. Uh, if you want to be a, a CNA, we have a series of modules that you can go through. And at the end, you should be prepared to be successful in a post-secondary setting, getting your hours of credit and passing the CNA test. 
if you want to be a certified phlebotomist or a certified pharmacy technician, uh, medical lab technician, uh, an EMT, these modules are created here and we can send them to you individually and you can work on them pretty much at your own pace. Now, we expect you to get through a module uh, within about a week or so, but the whole series of modules would take probably a semester, in some cases two semesters, uh, if you're looking at MLT uh, type things. So you know I am not a doctor, I am not a nurse, I can't certify people. Uh, they have to have college credit to do that, and it has to be by either a doctor or a nurse. Uh, my training is in medical lab technician, medical lab technology, and so uh, I, I can't certify anyone for for healthcare. Let's move on. This is this is our head rush. If you're interested in it, uh, if, at this point you could take and open it up, and it's going to bring me up, and you're I'm going to say some stuff. Uh, and that to, would be, to, you know, an introduction into Head Rush. Head Rush is an incredible individual plan of study opportunity. Uh, I can teach several classes at the same time, chemistry, physics, biology. I, I can teach them all at the same time. Health science, I can teach, you know, various uh, components of the health science curriculum. As I said, one of our things that I feel is most important is is in improving our accuracy and precision. High school students tend to have a real struggle with getting through the lab as fast as possible with whatever result they they have. And that's hard when they go on to this post-secondary and they start talking about precision and accuracy. And we're not talking liters and, and grams. We're talking milliliters and, and micro microliters or milliliters the accuracy and precision has to improve as we move along. Uh, in immunology, you use very small units. In hematology, you use very small units. Uh, so, so one of our goals is to slow our students down and to improve their accuracy and precision. One of the things that we always talk about that they struggle with is volumetric procedure. Uh, we do volumetric procedure here and and titrations and I believe it's one of the best things that we probably work on to improve their to improve their uh, accuracy and precision through their lab write-ups uh, if we uh, if you want to watch this of course you're more than welcome to watch it it is the video that the students watch uh, yeah, as we talk about at, uh, accuracy and precision volumetric. and volumetrics of course in order to to uh, use volumetrics, you also have to be able to pipette. And so we introduce the students to pipetting actually as freshmen. And uh, we do some microbiology as freshmen. And the students learn to do pipe titration, or they learn to do uh, pipetting and use serial dilution. Pipetting is one of those skills that takes a little time to get used to. It's not as hard as it used to be because now we have the the more measured bulbs. Uh, the, the just the pressure bulb is is kind of hard to to master, but uh, so pipetting is one of those things. Again, the procedure is here. Probably all of you are teaching all this already, but it's one of those things we want to maybe spend just a little bit more time on making sure they understand how it works, and actually how the math works behind it. Dimensional analysis. I can't overemphasize the importance of dimensional analysis. Every year, I, I encourage my students. I don't actually encourage them. I force them. I force them to do uh, dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis is an incredibly important math skill that I can't overemphasize enough. For the students going into nursing or into pharmacology, they're going to have to be able to do dimensional analysis to do determine drip rates. They're going to have to be able to do IV uh, uh, milligram determinations. There's just a whole bunch of stuff that dimensional analysis does. And so I, I really encourage everyone to spend a little more time with dimensional, dimensional analysis, ensuring that everybody can do it. 
I, a lot of our students struggle when they get to get to college algebra, uh, and so uh, you know anything we can do to help them get through that is to their benefit. Dimensional analysis is just one of those skills that that we need to to really master. And of course, if you click it, it's going to tell you a little bit about dimensional analysis and work a couple of problems and give you some, you know, some uh, ex exercise problems. All these all these videos come from Headrush, and so they're my Headrush that the kids actually see and that they they have to work through. So you have to forgive some of them if they seem kind of odd. Okay, the litigation. And litigation is one of those um, skills that we need to master. And many, many times we don't spend a lot of time with the litigation. But it's it's how we, it's if you read the example, you need 800 milliliters of 10% dextrose solution. You have on hand a 50% and 5% solution. How will you mix them in order to get 800 milliliters of a 10% solution? We use what's called the tic-tac-toe method. If you're a math guru, I'm sure you scringe when I say tic-tac-toe method. But for us uh, medical folks, uh, you know, that's that's okay. We use it. So the, the litigation. And I would encourage everyone to spend a little bit more time with the litigation, helping students learn how to do two solutions to make one. Hey guys, welcome. And that's me again starting. Serial dilution is another one. Uh, it seems like, you know, math tends to be the one struggling point when they come talk to me uh, that they have, have some problems with. So we always talk about serial dilution. Uh, we give you, a, we do an example of serial dilution and, of course, uh, how to do the mathematics behind serial dilution. This serial dilution is an incredibly important tool in medical technology, uh, medical lab technology. We use it to determine uh, titer, which is uh, the number of antibodies, uh, the number of antibodies in the serum that are effective towards a specific antigen. Today, with COVID, that's that's what we call the you know the antibody test is a, is a titration test, and so. Uh, it's one of those skills that I would encourage everybody to spend just a little bit more time on hey guys. Uh, to make sure our students can do with them. Before we end, I always like to take a minute to talk about our community involvement. Stafford is, uh, our community is about a thousand people. And so we have, we have a small community. We do have a county hospital here. We uh, have a, a extended care facility. We have built a mobile wellness unit and the Stafford Senior Citizen. Now, we have participated with all these groups extensively before COVID. After COVID, we haven't been out as much as we have in the past, making sure to protect our students and, and our population. Our population here is an elderly population, and so we have to be very cautious about uh, spreading a, a a virus. At the hospital, in, before COVID, we were able to do job shadowing and internships. Some of our students were even employed by the hospital. We have had a record of, of CNAs being uh, employed by the hospital. We've had a record of uh, phlebotomists being uh, uh, employed by the hospital. We've had students that have become medical lab technicians and have worked at the hospital. So we have had a really good tie with the hospital uh, on a, on a couple, on, for the past few years. In the near future, we're going to have a flex Friday, which is a Friday where we don't have the traditional classroom. So generally every Friday, every flex Friday, which is not every Friday, but once a month, basically, I have someone from the medical profession come in and talk uh, about prenatal care, uh, child development, uh, smoking, you know, just different health issues that that the students need to be aware of. 
generally they're not terribly well attended. I will give you fair warning if you're if you're against frisbee football and tennis and 